Welcome back, everyone, to Market Wrap. I'm Ali Ansari, President of Compaq Asset Management, and it is my honor today to have Dr. Milton Friedman on the air with us, sharing his thoughts about the markets, about interest rates, about globalization, about employment, just about everything, and it's uh, really an honor. He, as you know, was the recipient of the 1976 Nobel Prize for Economics. The, Mr. Friedman also was awarded the Presidential Medal of Freedom in 1998, received the National Medal of Science the same year. I can go on and on talking about it, but I would rather take the time and just ask him a few more questions. Uh, uh, Dr. Friedman, how do you feel about India? Uh, we will, uh, will we continue to focus? Will they continue to focus on basic technologies, or will it become an economic powerhouse in, like China has so much outpaced India in productivity? Uh, is India ever going to catch up, or do you think this is just the beginning of a long-term trend as, sort of, as far as China and India are concerned? Well, India has the potential to be a very productive uh, economy. If it would, well, uh, it, to, it has every potential to grow as rapidly as China did in the past. However, that potential has been uh, has been uh, prevented in the past by the socialist tendencies of the Indian government. They've got a very, very deep bureaucracy. And I, spent, I was in India for some time uh, uh, advising the Indian government 55 years ago. Right. <laughs> uh, and uh, at that time, I wrote a memo in which I emphasized the extraordinary possibilities and opportunities which India had. It's, it's, and the extent to which they were being frustrated by its following an economic policy of socialism, of central direction and control. It has recently been moving away from that. It has recently, and at long last, been moving in the direction of a more role for free markets and for competition. But it's still very limited, and it still remains to be seen whether it will be able to continue on that path. Recently, it's been growing very rapidly. And if it continues, it will be another miracle, like the Chinese miracle. Now, in both China, uh, in India, the interesting thing about India is that it's a democracy. Politically, it's free. Compared with China, it's a much freer country. Right. Uh, politically, but economically, it's uh, while 50 years ago it was more advanced than China. Today, it's well behind China. China has grown so rapidly that its output is now a multiple of India's output. Right. I do wonder... the world, the problem is not globalization. Mm -hmm. The problem is a resistance to globalization. The problem is that countries like the United States and other similar countries insist on following uh, protectionist po policies, which make it difficult for the emerging countries, for the countries that would like to be emerging countries, uh, to develop their trade. We in the United States, for example, have an agricultural policy which subsidizes agriculture. Right. And it doesn't, is there any reason at all why an American consumer should have to pay three times the world price for sugar? The only reason is because of the political influence of the, uh, of the, uh, of the growers of beet sugar and cane sugar. Right. Well, that's uh, that's part of, uh, d as they say, all politics are domestic. And let's talk a little bit about China. You touched on that, and China is becoming an economic powerhouse right now. And some ec economists point to the massive uh, bad debt pr problem that uh, could be the problem in the Chinese banking sector that could bring down China. Well, a lot of people are saying China could continue to grow at the rate of 8% or even higher and un uh, ultimately become a dominant superpower economically and mi militarily. Is this something that we should be concerned about going into the future? I think it would be a very desirable thing if China continues to grow. After all, you have an enormous population, uh, and many of them, uh, while they've been growing very rapidly, their level of living is still relatively low. I believe that as they improve economically, there will be increasing pressure to move politically toward a more democratic system. And what would really be good for the world and good for the Chinese would be that they, they, their political system shifts over to a freer, more democratic form. And at the same time, 
economically, they continue to grow very rapidly. That is an ideal scenario, that they, they continue to grow rapidly and then they change over and become... But what if they politically well, do not... There are tendencies in that direction. Economic growth tends to promote political freedom. Uh, you are seeing signs of that in China now, where there's an increasing use of elections at the local level, not at the central national level or the regional level, but at the local village level. There are more and more use of of uh, elections to select their leaders rather than an uh, appointment from the center. Let's talk a little bit about uh, domestic politics, if we can, uh, Dr. Friedman. We are talking about the exporting of America and these jobs, and you touched on that. So you think this is a lot of rhetoric that we are hearing about the jobs being exported out of, uh, of this country, and it is uh, not really detrimental in the long term for, for it's the jobs that are moving. It's not detrimental in the long term. It's not detrimental in the short term. It's part of the process of growth and progress. If we find that somebody else can perform some uh, perform a service or produce a good more cheaply relative to other things than we can it's in our own advantage to to use the lowest cost 